On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including SpaceX tests their Starship Lunar Elevator, Stoke Space CEO Dr. Andy Lapsa talks design philosophy, and NASA greenlights two solar airplanes for missions on Mars and Venus. This is the Space Race. SpaceX and NASA were busy right up until Christmas, it seems, as a NASA article posted on December 21st gave us our first look at the elevator designed for the human landing system Starship. Built at the SpaceX facility in Hawthorne, California, the prototype mobility equipment is made up of a full-sized open-air car, or basket in this case, which operates on a scaled-down version of the cable and rail system that is intended to be built on the Starship vehicle that is scheduled to take a NASA crew of astronauts to the lunar surface in 2025. For this test, astronauts Nicole Mann and Doug Wheelock got suited up in bulky approximations of the lunar EVA suits that NASA will be using and attempted to use the controls while wearing those clunky gloves. Gate latches, ramp deployment gear, and movement with proxy cargo were all tested. This elevator is intended to carry astronauts, cargo, and even vehicles like the Flex rover to and from the landed HLS Starship. So the engineers need to know just how difficult it is to use while wearing an EVA suit. A full-scale elevator will be enormous as well, operating up a 50-meter Starship in one-sixth Earth's gravity which will be tricky to manage, so obviously this is just the first of many tests that will need to be done on this system, but if they're already at interface testing with suited astronauts, that's a pretty good sign. And California wasn't the only busy SpaceX facility, as over the course of the December holiday season, the company has been hard at work repairing parts of their launch site at Boca Chica, Texas, testing the next flight candidates for Starship's upcoming third flight, and bringing in parts for a second launch tower all the way from Florida. It's wild to see just how fast the orbital launch mount was refurbished and getting used for test fires, but they'll still need to find ways to speed it up if they want to get the sort of launch cadence they're hoping for. In terms of a third test flight, we are still waiting to hear from the FAA and their mishap investigation regarding the rapid unscheduled disassembly that ended the second test flight. However, it looks like the SpaceX team are still getting the next Starship ready to launch, so there's no rush yet. After a very successful 2023, Stoke Space CEO Dr. Andy Lapsa sat down with the folks at NASA Spaceflight to give more details on his company's unique launch vehicle and the design philosophy that led to its unconventional makeup. Stoke had gained a small following thanks to a video by the everyday astronaut detailing the company's second stage and its unique heat shield and thruster technologies. That was back in February, and after almost a year of work on the prototype of their Nova rocket, we hadn't actually heard much from Stoke until January 7th when Dr. Lapsa sat down with John Galloway from NASA Spaceflight. Dr. Lapsa is an engineer by trade who has worked previously with Blue Origin on their BE-4 engines. In fact, many of the barely 100 technicians and experts working for Stoke come from other companies in the industry like Blue Origin and SpaceX. And so, in addition to there being a high degree of technical know-how among the relatively small crew at Stoke, there's also a degree of focus that is hard to find outside those larger companies. Nothing made that clearer than the way Dr. Lapsa described the systems of their reusable upper stage, the one featured in previous tests, and that video we mentioned. It's no mistake that the second stage of the Nova rocket, as it's being called, is getting so much attention. Dr. Lapsa says that it's the most important part of the rocket. Seeing the success of reusable pioneers like SpaceX, Stoke decided to go all in. Everything about the rocket is designed for reusability, especially the second stage, which Stoke believes is the key to making their rocket an industry leader. And a big part of that was the laser focus on what Stoke wants Nova to do. It's a cargo pod made for reliable landings. Everything about the design of this part of the vehicle has been designed to reduce weight, waste, and time. A heat shield made without heavy tiles or ablative material and cooled by the same cryogenic hydrogen fuel they already carry into orbit with them saves on weight. 30 engine nozzles arranged around the rim of the rocket to disperse weight directly to the structure, saving them the need to fortify their internal fuel tanks. 
a thruster control software package that eliminates the need for gimbaling engines and the dynamic seals that often break down on them. Payload doors instead of disposable fairing, which allows the upper stage to both deploy a payload and return with one safely, and could even be used to capture space trash. The Stokes CEO talked about all of these as a way of explaining how the team went from one innovation to the next by solving small problems in the way of their goal, which was to offer a cheap and easy medium lift solution with a fast turnaround. He explained that right now, pretty much the only name in reusable fast launch services was SpaceX. That's going to be changing in 2024 as other companies like Blue Origin start launching their own vehicles, but there is a huge gap in the medium lift market that's only being served by a few companies, and most of them use disposable rockets and take a while to get back to the pad after a launch. And so this rocket is being designed to be as fast as possible, using a reliable and safe landing system to keep their second stage safe, as well as reducing the amount of parts that can fail so that refurbishment is quick. They even want to skip the lengthy inspection processes that usually bog down turnaround times. That's why so much of the second stage on Nova is built with a no part is the best part ideology. No gimbling engines means less to fix, no hefty heat shield tiles means no technicians trying to glue them back on after each flight. Provided their landing systems can work as well as they want them to, Stokes' second stage shouldn't need repairing after every flight. As for the first stage booster, well, it might look a bit familiar, and that's because the engineers at Stoke are taking a lot of inspiration from the Falcon 9, which is why less time is being spent on it. SpaceX already proved how a booster can be flown and reused for the last nine years, and as we said, many of Stokes' team worked on those same systems. Dr. Lapsa says that in the future, they would like to try making a crewed version too, but it's just not in the cards right now. Designing for a crew means life support systems and backups for their landing systems, which is extra weight and complexity that just doesn't make sense for the type of customer Stoke is trying to impress, namely satellite services and station support missions. But that seems to be the right call, as with their efficient approach to design, Stoke managed to score themselves a hundred million dollars in new investment funding back in October as a result of their outstanding hopper tests just a week before that showed a huge leap in their technology from their everyday astronaut interview. Having an untethered test of a new thrust control system with a bold gamble that paid off and Stoke has been closely watched by the community ever since. At the speed they're building and testing, we might see a full launch to landing test later this year. With the new year comes a new round of funding for projects in NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts program. NASA has used this program for over a decade, fostering interesting new technologies to help in their missions, which has led to some pretty wild concepts getting a chance for testing when they might not have otherwise, like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's Float Lunar Railway System from 2021. This year, a series of hopeful companies have had their concepts selected, and two of them revolve around the idea of solar-powered planes for use on other planets, which isn't a lot, but it's weird it happened twice. The first and most promising is Maggie, the Mars Aerial and Ground Global Intelligent Explorer. Riding on the success of the Mars helicopter robot Ingenuity, Florida-based company CoFlow Jet has developed a fixed-wing solar-powered flying exploration drone with some very slick capabilities. CoFlow's claim to fame is a type of vertical takeoff and landing technology they've developed using an electric, high-efficiency jet and powered flaps. It's a zero-emission system that has a lot of industry weight behind its development, DARPA being just one organization CoFlow credits with supporting their system's development. The plan for Maggie is to create a VTOL aircraft that can both fly in the thin Martian atmosphere and interface with other Martian scientific missions, all while spending huge amounts of time in the air. According to the NIAC briefing, Maggie should be able to fly 179 kilometers over about seven days at an altitude of 1,000 meters before needing to land and fully recharge using its solar panels, which are mounted on the wings and body of the flyer. The company believes that Maggie should be able to explore the entirety of the Martian surface, and with the new NASA research grants, CoFlow can begin testing in a simulated Martian environment to prove that their plane is up to the task. 
And Mars isn't the only place NASA thinks solar planes can be useful. Put forward by NASA's Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, a new idea for a Venus surface sample return mission also got an NIAC grant for testing. Much less is known about this plan, as it looks like it's in a much more early phase of development than CoFlow's Maggie idea, but as the density of the Venusian atmosphere is so much thicker than Earth's, a plane would be able to stay aloft much easier, so it makes a good deal of sense to use one for sample retrieval. Ingenuity proved that our robotics and automatic piloting software has gotten to the point where flying robots on other planets is a workable idea. And even though the concepts being tested in the NIAC programs are years away from becoming full missions, it looks like NASA is very interested in making ExoFlight a reality. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.